here. And we can dive in. What did we learn last week? And just a reminder, guys, that cameras uh, need to be on for the majority of class. It's very hard to teach without being able to see your faces and your reactions and how things are going. So I know that uh, it's, it's a pain to keep the camera on all the time. Um, and if you need to turn it off or run out for a, a, you know, a little thing, that's fine. But um, very important for me to be able to see your faces. Um, while the feedback form is certainly helpful for taking your feedback and implementing it, um, <laughs> It's uh, it's just one of those things that I need to see you guys when you're struggling. That's okay. Part of this experience is going to be the struggle, right? But without the video on, it makes me hard to see how you guys are are doing and progressing. So, um, that's that's why we do it. Anyway, uh, what were we learning last week? What are some light bulb moments you had over the weekend? What are some struggles you're having with free code camp or the assignment? How are we feeling? Is there anything you'd like me to review for the homework? Talk to me. Other than the submission, we will definitely go through how to submit into Canvas. Archel, go ahead. I tried doing the homework through the free code camp. I got stuck at a certain point. I tried the rubber ducking, wasn't working. And I kind of ran out of time today to see if I can implement other aspects of the code. You know, minus like I got up to like step 20 and I'm just like, why isn't this working? I I didn't have any, many small victories this time around. I had a yeah. couple, but not like last assignment. Well, you had 19 of them, right? And I think that that's important. <laughs> so um, free code camp can certainly be frustrating when you're like, I did exactly what they told me to do and it's not working. Why can I not get through this, right? And the reasoning behind that is free code camp wants you to do it kind of their way or the highway. And so when you don't get that check mark, you're like so frustrated. One trick, and I think I showed this in office hours, is that if you're on free code camp here, and let's just say you're on step four, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, you can't get past step four, mm -hmm. um, this one is saying add a title and a meta uh, element to the head, right? Well, if you come up here and move to step five, what they're actually going to do is uh, show you the solution in the previous step and let you continue on. So if you modify this step number up here at the top, it's actually okay. gonna show you the answer and let you continue on. So that's obviously something where if you're doing that a couple steps in a row, now you may want to say, all right, let me take a step back. Let me figure out, you know, why I, I have to keep on using that, that navigation around, right? Um, right? The other thing is if I were doing this in free code camp, I would be royally annoyed. I would be like, just give me my text editor. I have what I need to build. Let me just go build it, right? And that's why we give the, the option of doing the, the homework assignment. If you want to go build that on your own in VS Code, there is nothing, nothing wrong with you doing that, right? So this just goes back to your learning style, right? Everyone learns a little differently. If you want that step-by-step -step guidance, you're going to get it, but you're also going to get the frustration because it's broken down into so many small steps. You can look at this and be like, all right, step one through 10, VS Code did for me with an exclamation point and an enter. But at the same time, it's very helpful to go through free code camp and for them to be explaining out what every little piece of it is doing to get that understanding. So there's, you know, double edged sword here of uh, there are certainly benefits to doing it in free code camp and having that breakdown. But then there are also those frustrations of, well, I made it all the way up to step 20 and I had momentum and I was doing great and I just couldn't get past that one step. So what's helpful in free code camp is knowing that you can actually, I think even if you go back to the menu in the curriculum and scroll down to the right section, uh, the right project, it will let you skip to any step that you want. So if you skip all the way to, this was registration form, if you skip all the way to 62, and click on index.html up here, it's actually going to show you the entire project finished, uh, all 44 lines of it, right? 
Now, I, that I'm not encouraging you to just go to step 44 and copy and paste the assignment and say, all right, I'm done. But sometimes knowing the answer makes it easier to go back to the step that you were stuck on and figure out why it wasn't letting you through. So right. free code camp is, it can definitely go both ways. Um, in one minute, I'm going to uh, show you guys how to create a file for this and properly submit it in Canvas um, so that we can we can review that as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Agonza, go ahead. It's Exona. Um, so OK, nice. so um, I actually did what you just showed. I have my sticky. I am trying to get the names <laughs> right. It's OK. Um, I did exactly what you just showed, was just go to the next page and see what it is and see how I did it right or wrong. Sometimes I would have it right, but it would just not register. Um, but honestly, using um, free code camp just confused me even more, right? Because we were used to the divs and we were used to the rows and the columns. And that just, that I was like, what is going on? This is, even after I was done with the whole free code camp, I'm like, I don't understand anything. Like it didn't, and any, and it, it made things worse for me because I didn't understand a single thing. I'm like, okay, cool. I got it done. I could submit this for a grade, but it's just going to be a grade. I'm not understanding it. So, and I did try and I did it through VS Code and that was so much easier for me. And that's okay. And that happens, right? And you may only get to step four of 60, 61, 62 in Free Code Camp, however many steps it is and be like, I am ready to light this thing on fire, right? <clears throat> and you're going to have that not only in HTML, but you're going to get to JavaScript. And you're, I know you heard from cohort three students already. You guys are going to be like, I'm never going to get this and have major imposter syndrome and be like, uh, why is JavaScript a language? It, it deserves a certain circle in hell, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, again, practice and practice and practice. Remember the first divs, the first HTML tags you were creating and you're struggling with it. And then remember how it felt when we got done weather project, right? And you started going, oh, I made a whole website. Like I could see that actually be live on the internet, right? We have two more weeks of HTML and CSS. There are very few more principles, new principles that you guys are going to learn. We still have to touch on mobile responsiveness a little bit, but we're going to build an entire portfolio site and we're going to rebuild the Netflix homepage. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds far-fetched, but those are our next two upcoming projects, right? That is all about more and more practice. Is my internet choppy? You guys are choppy on my side and I just want to make sure you guys can hear me okay. Okay, cool. Um, Sorry, it's been temperamental for me all day. Um, sorry, just responding to a message. Um, so um, you guys are gonna get more practice with this, right? And that is the very reason why we why we give you either option, right? We say this is what you what we want you to make. If you can make this in VS Code go make it in VS Code. And if you can make this and do step-by-step -step in Free Code Camp, go do it in Free Code Camp, right? That is going to exist well after you get out of the workforce because there are multiple ways of creating a page, right? When you go through all of Free Code Camp, if you made it to the end, you may get to the end of that and be like, wow, I understand how this is working much better than when I wrote the code because I had it broken down step-by-step. -step. Or you may go into VS Code, do it an entirely different way, and still make it look identical to what you would have made in Free Code Camp with completely separate code. And that is okay. Everyone codes a little differently. And when I have worked with the members on my team for long enough, I can actually tell who wrote the code without looking at the, the actual author or who wrote the file because everyone's code style is a little different and everyone thinks about the problem differently. That is what makes you a good engineer. 
to be able to break things down and think about a big complex problem in small pieces. Now, those small pieces may be broken up at different places, and that's sometimes the difference between free code camp and, and um, you know, the way I've taught it or in VS Code. So everything is a little different. That's why I like to offer this assignment up, because it gives you a chance to see something different, right? Uh, the way I, I teach it is the way that makes sense to me. That's the way that I would build it. But you may be sitting in class going, I'm not getting this. I'm going back. I'm rewatching the videos. I'm not getting it. Did anyone like Free Code Camp more than VS Code? I okay. kind of like both, you know. Okay, good. I'm glad there were a couple of you that went, all right, this is this is an experience, right? Uh, Tina, go ahead. I couldn't find my unmute. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I did not know they give you the answer for one, or I will not have been stuck for hours. Um, I kind of get it. Like, I get how... It, it was challenging. I, I just finished late last night. It was challenging, but I, the challenge was, um, I don't know. It was like, it was like a test. Like I, I was, I, I was up for it. Like I was, it was, uh, I don't know. It was like a game to me. It, it, it was incredible. I, I was like, all right, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. And then, um, um uh, Alba helped me and then you had helped me on two pieces but other than those two pieces I got it and I felt I was like wow babe I did this holy crap um I I would not have had that instant satisfaction you know knowing what I was doing if I was doing it through VS code I wouldn't have known where my code was wrong I wouldn't have known what I needed to work on or pay attention to um, so I, yeah, I like it because it, it gave me that instant, you know, feedback and, and uh, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, um, th there's a lot. Um, so last cohort, we had homework almost every night and the homework every night was, Hey, we've got this one little thing to wrap up based off of what we did in class, wrap that up, finish it up, move on to the next one. And then we had people start their capstones and they were like, I haven't started an HTML file from scratch ever. I just kept on using the ones that we did in class and finishing it up. And now I don't know how to start a project. And so that's why we shifted our homework the way that we did is we're trying to make it to say, hey, if you can complete the homework, that is a sign that you are keeping up, right? You are understanding these concepts in class and you're ready to move on to the next thing. Um, Jordan, I know you had your hand raised. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I don't know why it just cut off my thing, but uh, at first we had like a major difficulty with it. Um, we just simply weren't getting our code to work. And then after a couple of attempts, actually not a couple, like nine or 10, maybe 12, 13, on one part, we would um, get through it. And I found that it was like, especially at the end when I finished everything and I was like, oh shit, I, I find it immensely helpful like super helpful. Awesome. So I, I think it's important to hear that right from other students, because you guys all learn differently. And there's nothing wrong with identifying your learning style. It just may be the case that one, not only are you learning one of the hardest things to learn, but two, you may have been out of the classroom for a while, or if you are, uh, maybe you've been in the classroom recently, but haven't been challenged to go this fast recently, right? So that's why we, we expose you to all of this. There will be some homework assignments you absolutely cannot stand. And because of that, you learn the most from it, right? That's okay. That happens. The important thing to keep in mind here is that this is not just about the grade, right? This is about you understanding it. And that's the hardest thing to do when you're sitting in class, when you're seeing me code and you're like, I just want to get my code to work. That is not the objective. The objective is to say, why are we writing the code that we are writing? How is that code working? And do I understand how I would write that code in the future 
if I had to do it for a homework assignment or at work or whatever it is. And the tough part about HTML and CSS is there are only a couple concepts, right? Like under 10 concepts you got to understand. But those concepts are so complex that when we teach it, we bombard you with those 10 concepts right out of the gate. And then we give you guys uh, four weeks total to practice, practice, practice that HTML through all of the, the projects, right? And right when you're feeling good about it, right when you've made your next Netflix site, right when you're ready to move on, then we go into our, our uh, JavaScript, right? With a, a DevOps week in between, and we do it all over again. And then we keep on doing that, but everything builds on itself, right? So when you're falling behind, when you're like, I tuned in week two, day one, I was all fine. I tuned in day two, I had no idea what was going on. And I tuned in day three, and I still have no idea what's going on. Pause. Shoot me a message, say, I really need to keep, catch up on class. I'm going to go back. I know I lost you at week two, day two. I'm going to go rewatch that video. Shoot me that message. I'll mark you as excused on attendance. It's more important that you catch up on whatever project that is, because if you can't build weather app, you're not going to be able to build the new site. If you can't build the new site, you're not going to be able to build portfolio, right? So it's important to get those, those uh, concept, concepts down. There is nothing wrong in saying this isn't sinking in. Right, because what that says to us before we can even get to you, before we even need to talk about academic warning, I can jump on a one on one with you and just talk through where you're stuck. Right. And so, those that's what those one on ones are best for is everyone learns individually. And because of that, there are some concepts that we need to cover in class. A lot of you had problems turning in the assignments, it was in free code camp, you didn't know how to get it into Canvas. That was challenging. Okay, we should address that together as a class, right? But then there are other parts of it where you may be stuck on one individual thing. And if you're stuck on that one individual thing and no one else is stuck on it, it may just be that little 10, 15 minute one on one that gets you that light bulb moment and, and launches you back with momentum to keep going on the project. Uh, Christina, you asked about academic warning. Um, that is when we identify a student is falling behind, when they're not turning in homework assignments, when they're struggling on the homework assignments, um, when their attendance slips, um, when they're not engaging in class. We kind of look at a student holistically, right? So this isn't just about one homework assignment, you didn't do well on it. We don't, we don't break down students that way. We um, look at the student as holistically as possible to say, hey, you know what, this student is struggling, but they reached out to me, they said they're going through X, Y, and Z right now, uh, I've seen them schedule the one-on-ones, yeah, they're not doing great on the homework assignment, but I see that they're really putting in the time. Okay, probably not going to go on academic warning there, but academic warning, when we see you slip in after two weeks in a row, two or three weeks in a row, um, that's when we reach out and we say, hey, you're slipping. Let's come up with a list of things together that can say, hey, this is what it's going to take to get you back to normal academic standing, right? So this isn't an A, B, C, D. We don't break it all down. Um, we don't fail anyone out of, of the program, but we do have those guardrails set up. So if we notice you're falling behind, that's when we sit down and have a meeting and say, hey, we're not kicking you out. We're saying, this is what you need to catch up. Let's come up with that list together. We'll agree on it. And then you have a couple of weeks to, to catch up. That gives you access to more one-on-ones. That gives you that individual time to understand why you might be falling behind. Um, because we do want everyone to succeed in this program, right? We don't get any we don't get any benefit from the program. If you uh, are sh uh, struggling, you're falling behind, we want to get you those additional resources to, to get you caught up. Um, and so that's why we have that academic warning set up. Okay, give me a vibe check. Were there any particular spots in the homework assignment that you guys would like me to cover? Was there? That would have been helpful yesterday. <laughs> Was there? 
Yeah, I'd love it if you looked at my form and told me why I still have a white bar at the bottom. Sure. Do you want to share your screen? Yes, please. Thank you. This is the first time I've ever had like video feed issues on Zoom. And so I don't know if something's going on with Zoom or my internet, but everything is just very laggy. Hmm. I okay. Think internet across the city is experiencing an issue. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, my Zoom is acting up too. Oh, great. Okay. Well, it's a Zoom issue. That's that's good to know that it's not me for once. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking at um, where you've got your background applied, right? So you've got that applied on the ID called row. Now, if we look over here at your HTML, we see that you've got everything in this row right here. Mm -hmm. However, rows aren't really meant to have more. You've got a two and an eight, and I'm guessing that's what's centering everything. So what's happening is um, your row is only so big. Your row starts at this registration form at the top and goes down to your um your last submit and the button and all of that stuff. So that means your row is starting up here and it's going down to the submit button and then it's saying the row is over. Oh. So if we come up here and shrink up your page, we could go, oh, well, we fixed it. Now the whole background is in that dark slate gray. <laughs> <But what>? <laughs> obviously that isn't a fix because if someone loads the page and has the monitor or the window this big, um, we want it to cover everything. So what we do to fix that is instead of putting it on the row, which is what's containing everything, or putting it on the container fluid, which is going to have the same problem because the container is only so big, we're going to go all the way up to the body and apply it to the body. <laughs> so if we just change our selector to body, oh. now we've got our background all the way down to the bottom. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. And thank you. Um, and one more thing. I can't figure out how to make my submit button gray for the background. I had something in CSS. Okay, so I'm going to go down. Um, that is because you are not using a button. So if we use a button and we say it is going to say the word submit in it mm. and we take that out and close out our button, now we get a button like that. Oh. And if we wanted to, we could target our button and make the background, um, say, dark uh, gray. And if we save, then we're able to change that in there. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So put things in the body if I want them to apply to the whole thing. And that should have been button instead of an input type. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Max. Yep. No problem. Okay. Sometimes it's helpful. I'm going to pull this up on your screen. Um, there are two HTML cheat sheets that I really like. Um, one of them is htmlcheatsheet.com, and the other one is from Stanford. Um, these cheat sheets give you a big breakdown of kind of like what all of the tags are, right? It gives you a quick reference of how you put in a P tag. Um, it's going to show you like the different headings and sizes there, right? Um, it gives you a breakdown. We haven't done tables yet, but it shows you that. It reminds you how to do an A tag, right? And, and how that anchor tag opens somewhere else. It reminds you, hey, an HR is a horizontal line and a BR is a line break, right? That's what moves it down onto the next page. There's all kinds of stuff in here with the forms, right? And the different input types and all of that kind of, of stuff. So that one's really helpful. And Stanford has another one 
this is a uh, just a short two pager. It doesn't have quite as much on it, um, but it does give you a breakdown of what all the basic tags are. Um, you know, different graphical elements, how we make links work, and then same for forms and stuff like that. So. Um, having these cheat sheets can be really helpful when you're saying like, well, how do I know what all of these elements are supposed to be? Um, those those cheat sheets can help you out. Well, thank you so much. That's great. And again, some people may like some of these, but not other ones. Mm -hmm. um, Ariel, if you don't mind, can you throw a link to those cheat sheets in tonight's outline? I already did. Perfect. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, we are going to go, unless there are any other questions, we're gonna go over the proper way to submit in Canvas. Um, any other questions before we dive into that? Hmm. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, if at any point uh, it is getting so laggy that you guys like can't hear me or you can't see what I'm doing or Zoom is lagging so much that, um, you know, we run into issues, um, just let me know in, in Slack or um, in the Zoom chat or interrupt me and come off mute. Um, I know how, how terrible a laggy internet experience can be. And I really think that this is on Zoom side. It's not any of us or, or my internet connection. Um, so I think we're going to just have to suffer through. Um, but like I said, if it gets too bad at any point, uh, just let me know and uh, we'll deal with it as the problem comes up. Um, so let me just get set up here. Um, okay, so Exona, go ahead. You did it, okay. Um, I just, later on not right now we we can um i can ask you later before class is over on how to space the provide a bio section and how to space it a little bit more um i was able to do it on free code camp but i just don't know how to do it on um on vs code okay so that's it yep i will definitely okay so i'm gonna head over to free code camp and I'm going to jump to all the way to the last step, which is step 62, right? This is me cheating a little bit, but I want to take all of this code and move it into my own VS Code file. Once I get it in VS Code, I'm able to save it and upload it just like any of our other assignments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop open VS Code, and you guys can follow along with me here if you want. You don't have to. Um, although if you have not submitted your homework assignment for the weekend as an HTML and CSS file, like if you just copied and pasted it, um, we are going to ask you guys to resubmit it. Um, I didn't realize this, but it's much harder to grade the files when they don't come in as an actual HTML and CSS file. When the code just gets copied and pasted into Canvas, it creates some headaches for us grading it. So um, even if you turned in your homework, um, if you did not create an HTML and CSS file to turn it in, I am going to ask you guys to do these steps, but you don't need to do them right now. You can do them at the end of class or tomorrow. Um, that is totally fine. So what I'm going to do is in my VS Code, I'm going to go to File Open Folder. I'm going to make sure I'm in the Week 3 folder, and I'm going to create a new folder called HW. Remember that VS Code doesn't like opening individual files. It likes to be have one folder open and know that all of the context is going on in there. So I'm going to hit open here. And in my homework file, I'm going to create a new file called index.html. I'm then going to move this over, head back to my VS Code, and copy the whole index.html, right? This is my final product. I've got all my forms here. I'm going to copy this and paste it over here. I am then going to come back to the new file icon, which doesn't show up unless I'm hovering over the Explorer bar. And I'm going to create another one. And while we've been calling it style.css in, um, in our code, they call it styles. 
app.css. Now remember, you don't need to put this hashtag here. This hashtag is just showing you that VS Code is recognizing that this is a CSS file. So if I just call it styles, it gives me that generic line icon. It doesn't really know what it is. But if I type in that .c, it goes, oh, you're writing a C file. Well, no, we're writing a CSS file. So when you put in that SS, it's just changing the icon to show you, hey, I know that this is a CSS file, or hey, those tags are meant to say, hey, this is kind of an HTML file, right? It's recognizing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my styles.css, and uh, Free Code Camp kind of gives you the split view, right? So if you click on index.html, it uh, takes that split view off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Command A. I'm going to copy this whole file with Command C. I'm going to move back over to my VS Code, and I'm going to paste that whole file in and save it. Now, when I go down to my Go Live here, we can see the registration form just like we had it in our VS Code. So now that we've got both of those files saved and I can see everything in my VS Code, everything's moved over, now I need to go to Canvas and turn in the assignment. So I'm going to open up Canvas. And I'm going to go down to my week three homework. I'm going to hit start assignment. And instead of doing the text entry and, and pasting everything in there, I'm going to go to choose file. And now I need to be careful. I'm in day four. Day four of what? I have no idea. So I'm going to go to desktop, my code, week three. I'm going to pop open my homework folder. And I'm going to grab my index.html. I'm then going to hit open and I'm like, great, now what? I need to get my style in there, but if I hit choose file again, it's going to overwrite my HTML. I need to add in the CSS file as well. So I'm going to click on add another file here, hit choose file. Now I can grab my styles.css and now I can hit submit assignment and that should go through in one second. Maybe not because I'm in the student view. Did anyone try this and get stuck on a submitting dot, dot, dot button? Mine submitted correctly. Um, uh, Ariel has sent me a message yesterday that I needed to resubmit it. So I figured I copied it into VS Code and submitted it and it went through fine. Perfect. Yeah. And mine just took, I mean, you saw it. It took 45 seconds and then it finally gave me this submitted. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have submitted two files, an HTML and a CSS file, you're good to go. You don't need to resubmit anything. If you copied and pasted the code into the, the comments or the text editor, we're going to ask you guys to resubmit it. And the only reason we're doing that is because with 19 of you, it takes a couple minutes to grade everyone's assignment, right? And while a couple minutes doesn't sound bad, when you multiply it by 19, you get into a, a couple hours there, right? So if you guys don't mind, um, if you haven't submitted your HTML and your CSS file as files, we're going to ask you guys to just resubmit them like that. Um, and if you click on new attempt here, um, and say, hey, it says it's overdue. Do you still want to submit it? That's fine. We don't we don't have any penalties for late assignments, right? So just hit OK on that, and that will give you the choose file and let you upload those two once you copy and paste them from VS uh, from Free Code Camp if you completed it in Free Code Camp. Jordan, go ahead. So I opened it the way you told me to, but it's not allowing me to find it in um in my files. Like so when where, I submit, where did you save it in VS Code? I started a new folder like you did and named it homework. Okay, share your screen. Let's take a look. Okay. Is that working? Okay. Yep. So if you click on choose file in Canvas. Okay, now desktop, my code, week two, week three. 
it's not showing up here. Okay, so let me request remote control. I don't think you created your homework folder where you think you created it. He didn't label it styles. Um, that is part of the problem, but not the only problem. So I am going to rename this to styles before it, because, before it causes an issue. Now, here's a little trick. If you right click on the file and hit review, reveal in finder, okay. and then switch to the, the um, column view, you can see this is not in your desktop, in your my code folder. It's all the way up in your home folder. Uh, okay, thank you. Right. So now if we go through here, you, you probably want to move it back into the right place. Yeah. Um, but if we go to all the way up to your home folder here, you'll find your homework right there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Exona, go ahead. Um, so if, if we did both CSS, uh, free code camp and we did it through VS, do you want both? Whichever one you would like us to give you feedback on is what you should submit. And if you want feedback on both of them, submit both and just leave us a comment. Okay. Thank you. That's yep. it. And while I'm here and I've got the code open, I'm going to show you how to style the text area. Um, so let me go back to, this is my live server, right? Because we've got that IP address up at the top. And so let's say the provide a bio, I want to make it a white background instead of that black one. I'm going to go to my index.html and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, okay, there's a text area. So there are a lot of different ways I could target this. I could target the text area itself, or I could target that ID bio. And so just because that's a little bit more specific, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to target the bio and I'm going to say, hey, the background color on that should be white. And the font color should be purple. And uh, we'll just save it there. So now when I come over here, I got my background in white. And what I type will be in purple. Did that answer your question? Exona, did that answer your question about styling the text area? I think you're muted. Yes. Okay. Yes, cool. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on homework, on homework submission, on anything from last week? This is our chance to review before it gets away from us. I have a quick question about what is mean by field set in the it was used in the pre code camp. Yeah, so field set is supposed to kind of separate out your form. If you have a really long form, um, when you think about like a set of numbers, that's just a group of numbers. Um, same thing for a field set. It's just a group of fields that are supposed to be related to each other, right? So in this section, um, this is one field set because it has information about personal account or like the business type and the terms of conditions, right? So in the code over here, they put that into one field set. It's kind of like doing it as its own div, except the field set, I believe, has the... They just added this in here, right? So uh, you could replace it with a div, and I believe it would act the same way. Um, it is part of what we call semantic HTML. Semantic HTML is when we try and use HTML elements that are more descriptive of what's inside of that element. Um, so instead of using a div, they use a field set in order to say, hey, these form fields are related to each other. They're part of their own set. Hey, Max. Yeah. Um, somebody is having a hard time with um, submission. They want to do a breakout room. Is that cool? Yeah. Um, it's just Patrick and I. If you want yeah. to put us in a separate, I can't do it. So I just made you co-host so you can, but I got you this time. So are field sets and divs interchangeable or are field sets best used for forms? Field sets are definitely best used for forms. 
Um, from a styling perspective, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but from a um, what that basically is for is um, so that if someone uh, is hard of seeing, right, and uh, is struggling to see your site, they may use what's uh, called a page reader in order to literally verbalize the page out to them. And if there's a, just a generic div, the screen reader has no idea of being able to communicate to that end user who may be uh, not be able to see well, hey, that this is a one group in the form, right? This is one set of the fields. Um, but when you use that semantic HTML, when you get more specific, the screen reader is able to announce to the user, hey, this section is kind of all grouped together in a field set. That goes into um, HTML accessibility. Um, we're going to try and have one of our former graduates who is uh, an expert in accessibility uh, come in and be a guest speaker. Um, it's something that um, whenever you can use semantic HTML, you should. For example, what's the difference between if I'm in here and I say, hey, I'm going to make a div, right? And I'm going to put link one in here uh, and I'm going to put link two in here. Well, that would show up fine, but it is encouraged to say, hey, that's going to be my nav, and I'm going to put link one in it and link two in it, just like anything else. Well, to the browser, it doesn't matter. It treats this nav just like it treats this div. But when a screen reader is going through this, it's going to announce to the user, hey, the things inside of this, this section of your code is a nav bar. When it's a div, it can't really tell the user, hey, what kind of content is coming inside of this? But when you use that semantic element, it makes it easier for the screen reader to understand where the navigation is. Any other questions? Tina, go ahead. Um, something's wrong with my volume. I can't turn it up, can't turn it down, can't connect it to my beats, can't mute it, nothing. Um, I see it moving on my screen. I see it moving up and down, but nothing's happening with my volume. Have you rebooted your computer? No. You need to reboot. Oh, OK. Any other questions? Okay, we are going to dive in, let me make sure. Okay, so remember, when we are, whether you're following along in coding with me, the main objective is not to get your code to work. That main elusive objective is understanding why are we writing this code? What are we trying to build in this step? And after that code is done, how is that code working? Right, That's really hard to do, but we can't figure out what code we're going to write unless we've got a clear objective of what are we trying to build in this step. Because if we look at the whole website, there's no way that we could build all of that all at once. So thinking like an engineer, break it down. What are we trying to achieve in this step? Then what code are we going to write in order for us to achieve that? Is this something that needs to go in our HTML? Is this something that needs to go in our CSS? Is this something that goes inside this div or outside this div? Is this something that I need to look up how to do before I do it? That's everything that goes into that step. Then during class, whether you're following along or not, after every single step, we need to take a breath and say, do I understand how that code is working? Because the way that code is working is probably not the way that our human brain would think about solving that problem. But what we need to do, and you guys need to internally say to yourselves, can I read that code? And could I explain to a non-technical person how that code is being interpreted by the computer? Could I explain to someone else that when I put this style over here, 
it's going to go to my selector for my selector. It's going to go to the link tag from the link tag. It's going to go to the HTML in the HTML. It knows the div is between here and here. And that's why the background color is getting applied. Just a, a, a example on the fly, right? But when you guys, whether again, whether you're coding along or not, that is the most important question to, to ask is, do I understand what the code is doing? not is the code doing what I want. It is, is the, do I understand what that code is doing, right? I know some of you guys asked for a couple more notes. I push back on that a little bit because in the workforce, you're not gonna have someone hand you notes. You're not gonna have someone break it down step-by-step step for you, right? So if all you're getting out of class is the practice of breaking down how the code is doing what it's doing, not necessarily understanding all of the steps that it took to write that code, the how the code is working is going to be more important because that's the harder thing to learn on your own. During these three hour classes, getting that level of understanding of saying, I'm seeing that code. Do I really understand that code? That's what you extract out of these three hours. Because from there, the steps of all of that code is captured in the video, right? It's captured in the transcript. So building that on your own in your own sandbox is what is easier to do. What you can't do on your own is looking at the code and saying, I don't understand what that code is doing. It may be working, I may have wrote it out, but now I can't go to Google and say, Google, please explain this code to me, right? So that's what I want you guys to focus on in class because everything we're doing, again, we're not using a ton of new concepts here. This is more and more practice. So there will be a couple new things peppered in, but for the most part, we're focusing on how is the computer reading that code? How is it understanding it, right? Those steps, while they're important, those steps are easier to pick up than the actual understanding of the code. So while I'm writing out the code, don't even wait for me to take a break. Don't even wait for me to open up a poll. If I wrote a line of code and it's working and you don't know how it's working or why it's working or what we were even trying to do, that's when you got to stop me and interrupt for questions, right? It's hard, but that's how you're going to get there. With all of that said, we are going to dive in to making our portfolios. And our portfolios, I don't think are in the outline yet. Um, so I will link to that right now. We are going to build this page together. It has a, a basic header section. If we scroll down a little bit, there is a about section. There is a little contact section. And then there's a portfolio down at the bottom. For now, to get started, we're just going to use some placeholders. We've already did done this weather app, and we're going to do the Netflix app uh, next week or towards the end of this week. We may start it. For now, that's okay. We're going to get practice not only building out all of these sections, but also using an A tag to build out a secondary page that has more information. We're going to build our own little nav bar up here at the top. We're going to start learning about bootstrap components and how some things can be pre-built and we can still style on top of them. Before we dive into that, we're going to have a little fun. We're going to use a tool called coolers.co. That is colors with two opening O's. And I will dump that in the Zoom chat under the live stream and into chat as well. So once you get on this site, you can go ahead and hit accept all cookies. You can hit the little close icon here. And then you're going to click on start the generator. Now this is a palette generator. All it's going to do is generate five colors that all kind of go together. So you know when you're in the paint store, um, Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever, and they've got the, the book and they've got that single fan and you can fan it all out and you go, oh, is this light enough green? Do I want a darker green? That is not this. 
This is actually the booklet, not the fan. But when you're trying to get the design inspiration and you pick up a booklet and it's got 20 colors in it and all of those 20 colors go together, that's what Coolers is helping you with. This is a design tool to generate your palette. So if you click on Let's Go here, they will walk you through a tutorial um, where they're saying, hit the space bar to generate random palettes. When you like a color, go ahead and click on the little lock. You can continue hitting the space bar until you get colors you like. Um, when you do, um, it's easy to get addicted to building out your palette. And then they've got all of these hex codes down at the bottom. That's all you need for this tutorial. You don't need to go through the rest of the steps. So you can close out of that. And this is the random palette they generated. I can say, I don't like any of these and hit the space bar and I'm gonna get a totally different random palette. Now I go, all right, I like this. I, it's called purple navy. So I'm gonna click the lock button on that. And maybe I like this maximum blue purple. So I'm gonna lock that one as well. Now, I don't like any of these other colors. So when I hit the space bar, I'm going to keep those two colors. And my God, we went really hideous. So I'm going to hit space again and get different colors. This is a way for you to explore that, that hex palette, right? We don't expect you to be able to memorize these hex codes or know what looks good to you. But we're going to need all of these different colors to build our website. Because if you're looking at the portfolio site, you can see it's quite colorful, right? I've got this dark color here that's not quite black. I've got a, a deep blue. I got a lighter blue. I've got like a light purple, light blue going on. So we're going to need all of those different colors. You can make your um, website be whatever colors you want or you can follow along with mine, right? This is not meant to be some gorgeous uh, portfolio website. This is just an experience for you guys to get more practice with your code. It just so happens that this is the project that you'll be using in two weeks with Nathan to be able to deploy your portfolio website. This will be the first project that you make that's gonna go live on the internet, which is kind of cool. So. This is your moment for creative expression. Um, does anyone have questions on coolers or uh, generating your own colors? Um, couldn't find the website right away. So can I just have one quick um, review? I'm in it. I selected a color. Yep, you that... um, lock whichever colors you like. If you don't like any of the colors on the first generation, that's okay. And then you hit the space bar and that generates more colors for you. Thank you. Everyone have some colors they like? Does anyone have any questions on the site we're going to build? I'm gonna drop this in Slack. Um, it is also in the outline. If you guys have a different design, going back to your wireframes, if you want to try something else, you totally can on your own. And if you submit it with your homework, uh, I, can, I can provide you feedback on that, or you can send it right to me in Slack. But I'm going to encourage anyone who wants to follow along with me, follow along on this design, just because when you go off the beaten track, it can be hard to make sure that everyone's kind of getting it and progressing along. So... Um, that's why we're going to do it with this, this particular design. But if you would like to design your own homework and challenge your, uh, your own portfolio and challenge yourself, you are more than welcome to do so. And we can definitely get you feedback on that. Cool. We are going to dive in then. Um, I am going to open my VS code and hopefully this is feeling really repetitive to you guys. Um, so we're going to go file open folder. I'm going to get out of my homework folder and go all the way up to my my code folder. I'm going to create a new folder called week four W4. I'm going to create a new folder in there called D1 day one. And then I'm going to pop that open. 
Once I got my D1 open, I'm going to create a new file, index.html, and a second new file called style.css. In my index.html, I'm going to use my shortcut. I'm going to use my exclamation point and an enter, which is going to dump in a whole bunch of stuff for me. Once I got all my stuff dumped in, I'm going to say Max's portfolio is part of the title. And I'm going to put in a link tag with a rel of style sheet. That is telling our browser, hey, this link, what we're linking to is a style sheet. You should treat this as CSS, right? Without that, uh, it doesn't know what we're trying to link to. Then I'm going to put my href. That's telling it where the file is that it's, it's trying to link in. And I'm going to put my style.css in there. I come down to my body. And I open an H1 and I say hello just as a placeholder. Oops. I then I'm going to move my style.css over into a split column view. So I do that by grabbing the style and dragging it over to the right. From here, I'm going to do an H1 and I'm going to put in a color of red. And I say, Max, that's dumb. Why do we do that every time? We just delete that code. Well, there's no way of knowing whether our H1 is actually linked and pulling the right styling from style.css. So whenever I start a new file, I don't wait for the, um, I don't wait to actually start building things and getting well, well into my code and then realize my style tag isn't working. We wanna test in sm as small as a piece as possible. So because of that, um, I just put in some test code. I then click on my go live. And as long as I have a red hello, I am good to go and I am caught up. So I'm going to pause there. I'm also going to start a live share with you guys. Remember to join the live share. What I'm going to do is in Slack, I'm going to right click on the link. I'm not going to click on the link itself. I'm going to right click on it and hit copy link. Then I'm going to go back to my VS code and I'm going to go to file new window. In my new window, I'm not going to click on live share down at the bottom. I'm going to click on the live share icon on the left. I am then going to click the little join button. And if you have a pop-up down here at the bottom that says sign in as anonymous, go ahead and click on that. It may ask you for your name. Once you get to the link, I'm going to hit command V to paste in the link and hit enter. And that's going to bring me into my workspace where I can see the D1 code and my files in there. So I'm going to stop there and poll everyone. And if anyone has questions, ask them now because uh, you will struggle to keep up in, if you are behind on this step. Yeah, where, um, sorry, where's the link? Where did you put that? In Slack. Huh. Okay. Exona, go ahead. Can you? Uh what do you type in order for you to get the doc type exclamation point enter as long as the file is ending in dot html hmm. yeah i have that i just didn't do that okay hold on let me see really if you quick. delete out the whole file the file might have to be empty so if you hit command a delete and then your exclamation point enter it might drop it in i got it now thank cool. you no problem tina go ahead um when i okay oh oh okay okay vs code when um when i open vs code you're on the live share how is that do i open a new window yep you open a new window for your your own code okay now am i doing a um, new folder or file for day uh, index and style new folder I, every day is always a folder I mean, no, I got the day one, but under the index and style, is that file or folder? Those are files. Okay, thank you. 
Max, I'm sorry, but I don't see it in Slack. Is it in the live stream channel? Yep, live stream right here. You scroll down to the bottom. Oh, it's just not letting me do that. Weird. Other people saw the live share link? All right, there it goes. I couldn't okay. make it scroll. Sorry, thank you. Got it. All right, we've got 14 out of 18 votes in. Uh, I've got one more person and that's gonna be enough for me to keep going or we'll keep going in a minute. Okay, no questions? All right. So I'm gonna come down into my H1. I know I've got my color red working, right? Because if I'm in the browser, I can see the red showing up. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna delete out my H1 because I know it's all linked. And I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna say, all right, I want my website to be the full width of the page, right? So when I drag it out, actually, I don't know how I did it. When I drag this out, okay, I don't want it to be the full width of the page. I want there to be a little space on there because if this about section is pushed all the way to the left and this one is pushed all the way to the right, that's gonna be really narrow and thin. So I'm gonna say, if I'm on a big enough monitor, I want that to be kind of contained in with itself. Uh, Jordan, go ahead. Hey, sorry. Um, I think mine is messed up. I tried to say something before, but it wouldn't let me like click on raise hand. Um, I can't get my text to turn red, and I think it's because my index CSS isn't within like my index.html. So it should be oh, style.css. That's why. All right, my bad. I just said it out loud. Okay. Okay. So because I want my page to be contained here. What class am I going to use? A div container. Div class container. And what's the other option other than container? There's another kind of container. The field set? Nope, container fluid, right? That container fluid is what's gonna let the whole page spill out onto the edge compared to a regular container, which is gonna add in that padding on the side for me. So I'm gonna get started here and I'm just gonna make sure everything's working. I'm gonna do a div class row. In my row, I'm gonna put a call of six and another call, uh, we'll say call one. We'll say div class call six. I'm gonna put my call two in here. I come back to my browser. No, I don't. Zoom, get out of the way. What's out of these? I come back to my browser and my call two is right on top of my call one. Well, that's not what I want. Why aren't my columns working? I've got my container. I remember to put them in a row. My columns are right next to each other. This is a piece Bootstrap. of- Bootstrap, what about bootstrap? You have to go to the website. Need the link? Yep, yeah. exactly. This container, this row, this call six, the browser does not magically know what all of those classes are. So I need to go to my getbootstrap.com. I click on docs up at the top. I go down to the second step and I grab my link tag all the way over. I copy that, I come back here, and now this is important. I need to put it in above my style.css. I'm putting it above my style.css. So if I want to cascade or overwrite any of the bootstrap styles, I'm able to do so. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. I come back over to my code, and now I've got my column one and my column two working. Okay. That's great. Pausing there, does anyone need help with getting bootstrap?
I need help with um, getting my style CSS inside of my index HTML. It's still not working. Guard share screen. Um, so you called it styles.css in your file name, but the href said style.css. So you don't need it. You don't need it in there. If you open up your index.html, this part right here is what's linking to this file name over here. So you should be good to go in your index.html. Just save it. And uh, you don't have an H1 to turn red. And that's why you're not being able to see the style. So if you change your call one to uh, that div on 14, if you change that to an H1, the div on 14, and just put in the word test and then delete out 15 and 16, you should have the word test in red. And you're good to go. Any other questions? Or Charles, go ahead. I feel like a dope for asking this, but how do I see my code again? Live, uh, you hit the, um, in the bottom right, you hit go live. Thank you. I'll keep hitting live share like an idiot. Yep, live share is so that you can see my code. Go live is live server so you can see your own code. Max, do you mind if we could just see your, uh, how your page looks? Yep. Just so that we have an understanding. You should just have a call one and a call two to the left and right of each other. So again, going through this code, making sure that every line of this code, especially the ones that we put in, you understand. Hey, this container is adding that spacing on the side of the page. This container is coming from the bootstrap link up here. This link tag is coming over to the style page over here. Now, because we're on a 12 grid system, a six and a six are two equal columns that are showing up inside of the row. That's where we need to be at at this point in the program, right? Looking at that HTML and going, I could probably write that on my own. I could probably figure it out. But during class, when I see that code and I see Max's output, I can put two and two together and understand what the whole picture looks like. Okay. So now we're going to have some fun. We're going to build out our first section. So reminder, this is what our first section looks like. So I'm going to come back over to my code and I'm going to somewhat painfully delete out all of our rows and columns. Again, we just put them in there for project setup, right? We just put that in there to make sure that our bootstrap was working. Now that it is working, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new section. Okay, why am I using section instead of a, a div? 
Well, because it, my site is very clearly saying this is one section of the code, this is another section, this is another completely different section. So by using those semantic HTML elements, we're making it easier for screen readers to understand that my site is broken up into a couple different logical sections. We'll be using divs, those will be coming back. But for now, we're going to use sections to make it easier for screen readers to be able to read that. So I'm going to put an H1 in here, and I'm going to say my name, Max Matthews. I am then going to say, hey, underneath it, I want a slightly smaller header, and I'm going to put in um, uh, a little tagline. You can put in whatever you would like. Again, this is what we're working our way up to, something that looks like this. And then I'm going to use another new element called code. And I'm going to say uh, less than three uh, JS or less than three HTML and CSS. So if I save that and I go look at my portfolio, if I save that, Oh, it does not like the double slash. What's with the code tags? Um, it's just going to style it a certain way. So let me do an emoji instead and go live. There we go. Okay, got my name. I've got my header, which is slightly smaller than my name. And I've got this showing up and that's styled a certain way, but this is a long way off from this. Okay, so we're gonna start by using some alignment that Bootstrap has built in for us. So I open a new tab. You guys don't have to do this. I wanna just show you where this documentation is. So if we go to getbootstrap.com and we're in their docs over here, if we scroll down to the layout, you will see that there are some utilities in here. If we go into these utilities, they're going to show us, nope, not those utilities. Where is that? Um, Okay, I was in the right spot. So under these utilities, there's something that says Flexbox. Flexbox is a somewhat newer feature in CSS. It's been around for uh, well over five years now, but believe it or not in the CSS world, that's still pretty new. Flexbox is what allows us to go beyond the grid. Flexbox is what allows us to kind of move things around to be flexible enough on the screen to say, just put it in the center. I don't care how big this div is or this section is, it shouldn't be hard to center things. So if we go into these Flexbox utilities, there are some things in here that are going to make it much easier for us to center things. So if I scroll down here, all the way down to this justify content, I've got things in the center there. Okay, well, that's useful. Let's see how they're doing that. They're doing that with this thing called deflex. That is saying, hey, turn this, this thing into a, a flex box layout. Then we're going to use this justify content center to get our thing centered on the screen. So it's okay if you don't understand that, we're gonna get it working and then get to that level of understanding. We're gonna come over here and on this section, I'm going to add a class called deflex with a dash in between. That's what opens us up to be able to use a bunch of different flex utilities that are built into Bootstrap. Then I am going to justify my content center. So I'm going to save that. I come back over to my code and now, huh? Well, I guess that's centered, but they're all on top of each other. 
uh, I want it to flex, but I want to flex it in the other direction. I want it to be flexed so it looks like one big column. So I go back into my code. I go back into the bootstrap documentation and I'm like, it's not going in the right direction, right? So maybe I look under a line content here and it's showing me, hey, there are different ways of aligning that content. So if I look under direction up here at the top, this is actually where I wanted to go, it's showing me how instead of flexing across, which is what this is doing, it's flexing as a row, I want it to flex like a column. I want them to be on top of each other. So I come down here and I see the way they got these items on top of each other was by putting in a flex column class. So I copy that, I come back to my code and I put in a flex column. I go back over, I look at it, and now they're back to on top of each other. Okay. Now we just need to get it centered one other way. In addition to justifying the content center, we want to align the items as centered. So I come back over here. Now they're centered, but they're not centered on the screen. Why isn't my a lot my justify content center working? Right? If I take this out, it's not doing anything. If I take that out and save, it looks exactly the same. That class isn't doing anything. How do I get that to work? The problem is I haven't told it how big this div is. It doesn't know how big that section is supposed to be. So because of that, it's not making it much bigger. So I need to solve for that. I'm going to go into my section and I'm going to add an ID onto this section called intro. And now that I've added that ID, I can come over, target my intro and say, I want the intro height to be 100 VH. That VH stands for viewport height. In other words, the height of my window. I come over to here and I remember to save both of my files and now I've got everything centered. Okay, that was a lot. Let's go through and review. In this section, I put my three different elements that I wanted to show up. I put an ID on that section. So over in my CSS, I can give it some properties. I want it to be a height of 100 VH. That is saying this first section is going to take up 100% of my viewport height. From there, I want to flex this content around, right? Think about something being flexible. I want to move that content around. In order to get access to being able to flex things around, I put this bootstrap class on there called deflex. That's unlocking the ability to use all of these other things. The problem is most of the time when you're flexing content around, it's going horizontally in a row. I don't want it to go horizontally. I'm flexing this content on top of each other. So I tell it, hey, I want to flex that content as a column. Okay, now I've got them stacked back on top of each other. What do I want to do with it? I want to justify the content center. That's what's putting it horizontally in the center of the screen. And then I want to align the item center, which is putting it centered on the screen vertically. So if you have this working, what you can do is play around with this. Take out the justify content center and look at the screen. Okay, it's not centered. We go back, we put that in and we say, okay, now it's centered the way we want it to. We come back over here. Let's take out our flex column and see what happens. Okay, well, it's still all centered, 
but it's all flexed together as one row across. So what we need to do as an engineer is break that down and say, once we put our D flex in, that unlocks all of these other utilities. But looking at the bootstrap documentation over here makes it easier to understand, hey, when I flex as a row, it's going to look like this. I want it to look more like this. So I come down and use the flex column that they are using to achieve that. I'm stopping there. Let this sink in, give it a minute. And I want to hear some questions here. This isn't just about getting it working. This is about breaking down that understanding. We're going to have a uh, tool called Flexbox Froggy that breaks down all of the ways you can flex. Flexing is more complicated than using a grid, right? It turns out getting content centered in CSS is for some reason really, really hard. And it's something that Flexbox solves. But when you add in that layer of flexibility, you also add in a layer of complication as well, right? And so being able to break this down and say, let me put these in one by one is going to help me understand how it's moving my content around. Flexbox Froggy is going to do the same thing. So when you're in Flexbox Froggy, I'm just going to do the first one for you. It's going to be a lot like Free Code Camp. And Free Code Camp does have their own flex section. But what Flexbox Froggy is going to do is it gives you those 24 different levels. And what you're trying to do is get the frog onto the leap pad. And so what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, here are all of these different ways that you can justify content. OK, well, justify content is what we just used. So if I do justify content center, we're going to see the frog moves to the center. OK, but we don't want the frog at the center. We want the frog on the leap pad. That is at the end. So I read through all of this documentation and I say, hey, what I want is the items aligned to the end, to the right side. So I come down here and flex to the end. And now I have my check mark. My, red, my next button has gone red and I can move on to the next level. And now I'm going to learn more about justify content and how I can get that, that content centered so the right frogs are on the right color lily pad. So um, the Flexbox Froggy, we're going to add that to tonight's um, outline. And then um, Ariel, if you can add it as an optional homework assignment. Um, Flexbox Froggy is just going to open you up to Flexbox, make you understand it a little bit more. You don't need to do a deep dive on it. Flexbox is going to be totally optional for you to use on your capstone. And it's not something that you'll be quizzed on other than understanding the general concept of why do we use Flexbox, right? And it's Flexbox is the easiest way to move our content around the screen outside of a grid, right? So this is a way to make our content flexible enough to make it grow in the space. Because if we're in the portfolio site here and I shrink up my page, you notice no matter how big my page is, it's staying centered. That is a very hard thing to, to achieve in our code unless we are using something like Flexbox. So this is just meant to expose you to it. It is not something that you necessarily need to do a deep dive on. But if you're curious, if you want to learn more, Flexbox Froggy is definitely the place to go. Or, and I don't know a ton of people that are like this, but some people learn by just reading the documentation, going through here and understanding that this row is this code right here. And then coming down to this code and saying, oh, I can get the items in reverse if I flex row reverse. So all Bootstrap is doing is taking that raw CSS that you're learning in Flexbox Froggy and applying it for you in these classes, in these utility classes. 
Okay, that was a whole heck of a lot. I know we are at break time. I wanna stick around for a couple minutes. I'm gonna leave this code on the screen and I'm just gonna break it down so it's a little bit easier for you to see all the classes that we en ended on. Over here, you should have your name, your tagline, and a little code showing up and it should be centered on the screen. We achieved that by adding not one, not two, not three, but all four classes to our section in order to get that content centered on the screen. You can stick around for a couple minutes before we go on break and then uh, we will go on break and go from there. Schneider, go ahead with your question. Um, does VH stand for vertical height? Viewport height. Viewport height, what, what is that? Viewport height is basically the height of your window. Whatever shows up in your browser below the browser bar is considered your viewport. Oh, okay, interesting. And um, so Your window size isn't really accurate, right? Because you don't want the page to be including this stuff up here. So the viewport is considered anything that shows up in this white box. Um, and even if you go into inspect, now your viewport starts here and only goes down to here. So your VH is your viewport height for uh, starting here and going down to here. And then your VW is starting here and going all the way across to the end. So that's viewport width or whatever? Also? That's viewport width, VW. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Thanks. Yep. Archer. Yeah. So on row 13, mm -hmm. I noticed you put the ID before the class. Did you do it to make it easier to read because there's so much in the class? Yes. Okay. But and in general, does it make a difference where you'd put it um, in the line? Correct. Okay. And same for the the putting the classes all on their own lines. I just did that to make it easier to read. It, it works fine if you keep it all on the same line. Okay. Oh, Zoom is killing me tonight. I see who has their hand raised and can't see any of your faces. Uh, Tina, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, mine's all one row. Um, go ahead and share your screen. Do you have a line 24? No. Okay. Um, uh, where's my code? Uh, right here. Oops. Um, uh, you're missing an N in column. I knew it was something simple. All right. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Alba, go ahead. I don't have a problem with the code. I just have a question. Um, so you want us to customize? No, we don't like those. Um, I'm just kidding. You just want us to customize this to our what we want to write on it. So yep. as you're writing, you were not writing what you're writing. We're pretty much just putting our own words into it. You got it. All right. Thank you. Um, I know you already said it's just to style, but like the code thing is still throwing me off. That's all it does, style things? Yes. So it's just like a P tag or um, anything like that. It's literally meant to be an easy way to make your content show up in a monospace font, uh, which means every letter is the same width, which is how we write our code. Oh, okay. So is it like using strong or EM? Mm -hmm. Yep. It is just like those. Gotcha. Thank you except it's a, oh, maybe it is an inline element. I'm actually not sure, but yeah, it's just just like those. Uh, Jordan, go ahead. I cannot seem to get mine to like center in the center of the screen. Go ahead and share your screen. Um. Flex, flex, column. Okay, well, you're kind of centering. Let's go back to your code. You're centered in one direction, but not the other. Um, so 
Everything looks right there. Let's go to your style.css. Uh, and we are not looking into something we are trying to get. Oh, yeah, that's why. Time. That'll do it. <laughs> See, it's that point in the night where you're going, is he really that tired or is he just saying a word stupidly? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Aren't we all in a constant state of dying? You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you've got your code working, go on break. We'll be back at 730. If you don't have your code working, I'm going to stick around for the next four minutes and try and help you guys. Figures the class that I ask everyone to turn on their videos and Zoom decides to shit the bed, but. <laughs> I hear that CSS is very annoying to deal with, but Flexbox, in my opinion, has a whole other layer of annoying. Red. No comment. I am not a huge fan of Flexbox, but it is used enough that it's something that I would, that I'm obligated to teach. Uh, I could not say that in the first cohort three years ago. Now Flexbox is something that it's worth investing into. I still think the grid system is more valuable than Flexbox. However, with that said, Flexbox is more powerful as a whole than just a grid system. So something I mean, that I touch true. on... I like to open the door. I like to say, here's Flexbox Froggy. Here's a great way to learn it. But I am definitely in the learn the grid and master the grid first, and then work your way up to Flexbox column. Mm, gotcha. Kalai, go ahead. Uh, what is, is it... the short form to uh, insert the old HTML set? I, 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 was, I was just following you. I'm not doing it, but I forgot how to do that one, sir. So. Uh, exclamation point, enter. Exclamation, that's what I think I did. Okay. So I'm you do fight. the exclamation point first and then let go of both keys and then hit uh, return. Exclamation. Mm. And then enter, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Max. Is it working? Yeah, it's it's okay. it working. Cool. I was okay. I was pressing shift and exclamation and enter. It didn't work. So that's interesting. Yeah, you put the exclamation point in first, and then as a second step, hit the enter button. Any other questions before I go on break? Yes. Unrelated question. Oh, go ahead. It, it's a quick one. Why does my three HTML show up in red? Um, what section? It's line eighteen. That usually share your screen with me. That usually means that you're missing a closing tag somewhere. I just have to find my Zoom. <laughs> there we go. I feel like I need at least one other monitor. Um, let me see your code. Oh shoot! You're you're asking why the why the three HTML and CSS why that shows up in red? Mm -hmm. That is the default color of the code tag. Um, because it makes it show up like that. that's just the default color in the browser. Um, oh. To change that, one thing I'm going to do is, one, whenever you use a hex code, you want to put a, a hashtag in front of it. And okay. then two, if you wanted to change that, you could just target the code tag and say, I want the color to be white, and that oh. will change it to that. Great. Thanks, Max. Yeah, no problem. Schneider, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. How far back does the timeline go? Like, how far back can you retrieve something? Uh, in VS Code, I've never used the timeline feature. Oh, uh, okay. 
I'll play with it then. Thank you. You guys will be learning Git, which is a much better tool for tracking your code changes. Um, timeline, I mean, it can be helpful to find something that you did by mistake, um, but I'm uh, I'm just a command Z or I don't use the timeline. Gotcha. Archel, go ahead. So I have things centered, but not in the center of the page. Okay, go ahead and share your screen. Let's take a look. All right. Um... That's how that looks. And your my... screen share did not start. Right. That's because I forgot to kick share like an idiot. All right. Now we're good. Okay. So intro deflex, flex column. Um all of that looks right. Let me see how it looks in the browser. Okay. So we are missing something with our height. So let's open style.css. Ah, uh, okay. Um that you need your pound sign intro and curly braces. Intro, curly braces. And then you're going to do a height colon 100 and then the letters V and H. Colon. Throw a semicolon in there and save. And you are good to go. Thank you. No problem. Last call for questions before Zoom catches on fire. Okay. We'll see you guys. 7.30 for break. Dive back in here. So, um, one thing that I'm going to show you guys as a tool to set up, and whoever is not back yet is really going to uh, miss out if they don't see this step. So we keep on modifying our code, right? And so I'm going to say, um, I'm going to add in the word really here. And if I forget to save and come over here, now all of a sudden my word really doesn't show up, right? And that's really annoying. I added it here. I forgot to save. We know the 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 dot is the issue, all of that kind of stuff. Well, we're working on a thousand dollar Mac here. The Mac should be able to know, hey, I switched to another window. Just save the freaking file for me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to code up at the top, the very tippity top of the screen, go down to preferences, and then over to settings. Now, this is an optional settings change. You do not need to do it. But up at the top, what's the first thing of the commonly used section all the way up at the top? Autosave. Well, that's exactly what we want. If we change this autosave to say, hey, when the focus changes, well, what's the focus? The focus means that our cursor was in the text editor. And when it leaves the text editor, for example, when we switch to another window, it will automatically save for me. So I'm going to turn on focus change to my autosave setting, close out of this. And if I add in the word really, really, and come back over to my code and look at what happened, I didn't hit the save button, it automatically saved it for me. Again, that was code, preferences, settings, and all the way at the top, autosave, change that to on focus change. Now your code is going to automatically save for you when you switch back to your browser. Or Trell, go ahead. Mine is grayed out. It won't let me select after preface. It won't let me select settings. Um, are you in my window or in your window? You have to click on your window first. All right. Let me try that. That 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 was the answer. Thank you. No problem. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to take out my really, really, because I'm not really, really anything. OK, so now that I'm back in here, I want this is like looking kind of right, but it still looks nothing like this. I want to just whip that into shape, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of shrink this and try and fit three things on my screen. I'm going to try and fit 
my CSS and what the final version, what I want it to look like and what our current version looks like. Because our HTML is formatted right, I actually don't need to do anything over in this HTML. I can focus solely on my CSS. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I notice in all of this styling, right? I try and pick out the easiest things and work my way up to the more complicated ones. In this case, the more complicated thing was getting it all centered. Okay, well, it's all centered now. What's the next thing that I notice? The background is wrong. But I want that background to apply to my whole site, not just the intro section. So I'm going to go up to the top and I'm going to put in my body tag. Right. This is what Jennifer asked about earlier in class tonight. How do I change something on the entire site? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I would like my background color to be black. OK, well, that made it black, but this isn't black. This is a specific color blue. So what I would suggest is going to your colors now. Hopefully you left this tab open and getting whatever color you want to be in the background of your page. You can come down here and click on this and hit the little copy button, uh, Command C, then come back to your code and you're going to just paste that right in. So now my portfolio is that, I don't know, what would you call that? Pea green color, military green? I don't know, something like that. Oh, let's see, colors calls it. Rifle green, okay. But I have a color palette that I've already picked out. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that color in there. If you would like to use my colors, you are more than welcome to by just copying the hex code from my live share and using it in your own. Archrell, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't lower my hand from before. My apologies. Oh, okay. I'm trying to figure out why I can't see your CSS. Where, how did I do that? So in the live share window, you should be able to go to files over on the left and then open my CSS. Got it, thank you. Okay, now my background's right. What's the next most obvious difference between this and this? Well, I would say that would be the color, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, in my intro section, I want that to have a color of white. Okay, that's looking good, but this doesn't look quite like this yet. I want my name to be much, much bigger. Okay, well, if I make my H1 bigger, that will work for now. But what happens if I use another H1 somewhere on the site? I don't want all my H1s to be ginormous. I only want the one in the intro section to be bigger. So I'm going to come down here. I'm still going to target the intro section. But then I'm going to say I only want the H1 in that intro section. And I want that to be a font size of 96 pixels. Make it huge. Okay, maybe that was a little too huge. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make it, let's say, 66. All right, that looks, that looks pretty good. Now, if you notice on this site, we had a nice little, when the page loads for the first time, when the page takes forever and eventually loads for the first time, there's that nice little animation on there. Believe it or not, that is one line of CSS that adds that animation in. All we need to do is in this H1, we're going to apply an animation. And the animation that we're going to apply, I hit enter and it auto-filled way too much for me. The animation we're going to apply is something called fade in. And it's going to ease in to that transition, and it's going to last one second. So I come over here, I refresh, I get no animation. Where's my animation? Believe it or not, the fade in is not built in to the CSS. We need to define 
how that fade in works. So in order to do that, we have to write some additional keyframe code. So we use an, this at sign is saying, hey, we're using some fancy CSS feature here. This is not just built into anything. So we say keyframes, and then we're going to tell it what a fade in looks like. Now, a keyframe is kind of interesting because it's got to start somewhere. That's the starting from point, And we need to tell it what it's going to, what the final version of it's going to be. So we're going to say start at an opacity of zero and go to an opacity of one. Okay, CSS animation, newer feature, more advanced feature. But when we come over here and refresh our page, hey, we get a nice little fade in there. But I don't want just my name to fade in. I would like my tagline to fade in. So I come over here and I say, hey, in my intro, target the H3 tag. I still want my animation to be a fade in that is an ease in with a duration of one second and clear out all the other stuff that auto filled in there. And now I get my fade in. Okay, cool. But when I look in my final version, it fades this in first and then this. Okay, well, believe it or not, we can actually adjust that fade in by adding a delay, which is the second one S. And we need to start it at an opacity of zero, I believe. No, I did that wrong. Um, please hold animation delay one second. Oh, no, that broke everything. Don't follow me. I'm screwing things up. Um, what did I do to get that working? Um, animation delay. Why are you broken? Oh, do I need to do it up here? Animation delay, one second. No. So this is a good example. I'm going to look up CSS animation and I'm gonna to go to W3 schools and hopefully it's gonna show me uh, I can break it all out um, which is a good note of whenever we use a property like animation, there are several values that we're setting here. So oftentimes we can combine all of that together or we can break it out into its separate properties, which I think it's going to make me do because I do not see the combined. Okay, shorthand, name, duration, timing seconds. All right, well, let's just break it up to understand what it's doing. So let's do an animation name on this of fade in, and we can do an animation duration of that of one second, and we can do an animation delay on that of one second as well see if that worked out. Still not delaying right. Uh, can I do an animation fill mode of four words? Oh, come on. Okay, let's try start at an opacity of zero.
Okay, I've literally written this code before. Why is this not? Um, animation delay one second. Animation name fade in. Cheat and look at your uh, um, how would you call it? And you hit inspect on your own page to cheat. Uh, I've got my own code open. That's what I. That's what I'm referencing on my third monitor that you can't see. Okay. Um, I'm just very confused because I have my intro opacity zero. Um, I mean, if I just take this code and put it in. It's all broken and I have no idea why. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to come back to that because I'm not sure what I'm missing. That uh, H3 is there. If I take the opacity off, it shows up. But we want it to start at an opacity of zero, which is what it's doing here, and going to the opacity of one. It's targeting my intro, which I have set right here. My H3 is here. We start with the opacity of zero. We put a one second delay on it. Then we run the fade in animation, which is defined down here. We make the whole thing take two seconds, and then we say fill it in moving forwards. So, and if I take the opacity zero off, it does show up, but it does in start hidden. So, Out of curiosity, if I close it, stop it, and go live, that animation just is not running. I mean, mine won't run for my H1, but it runs for my H2. Well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um... happens if I just yeah it's not doing what I wanted um I'm gonna have to come back to this one tomorrow I am a little stumped and Art Charles to your point if I go to my one that's working I can right click on this and hit inspect and see in my style that I've got my opacity, my animation delay, the fade in, animation duration, animation fill mode, um, and the margin top all set right. Opacity, animation delay, uh, animation name, animation duration, fill mode. And then the only thing that I have on there is a margin top, which shouldn't impact anything. So... I'm not quite sure why that is not working. Um, so for now, I'm just going to have to leave the opacity off. The keyframes and everything else are exactly the same? Keyframes. Yeah, if this were wrong, um, I mean, it doesn't need the, the two on another line, does it? Yeah, no, those are, there's technically a space there. Those are all identical. Um, on the page itself, we can always view page source. Mm -hmm. It's going to take us into our CSS or into our HTML. And then if we click on the CSS, we can actually see how all of this is working. Um, and in here, we've got our H1 animation. 
And then in here, we've got the H3 animation. So I'm really confused as to why that's not working. Um, so like I said, I will work on that and get back to you guys during tomorrow's class. We've got a lot more to build out here. Um, so we'll get that working at another time. For now, what I would recommend is just commenting them out um, so that we, we don't run into any issues. Um, actually, we should comment out the whole thing. How do you comment it out? Highlight the um, code starting at the top and going down to the bottom or vice versa, doesn't matter. And then hit command slash and that will put in your comment for you. Sorry about that. When I figure it out, I will be sure to share with you guys why it's not working. Okay, we are gonna keep going. So this is looking good. Maybe I just need a little bit more breathing room here. So I'm gonna add a little margin to the bottom of this of let's say 20 pixels. And then on my intro code element, I'm going to add some margin to the top of it of 20 pixels. Now we just get a little bit more spacing there. That's kind of pushing them apart. And I'm feeling pretty good about that section. Do we have any questions reviewing all of this code, save from the animation, which is out to get me tonight? Um, about any questions about this code? Can we read this code and explain to anyone if someone came up and said, explain to me line 13 in style.css, would you be able to tell them what that random line of code is doing? If not, this is your time to ask, hey, can you explain to me what's happening here? What line did you say, Max? I'm sorry. Every single line. Ah, okay. I said, just pick a random line and make sure that you understand it but you should be able to do that for every single line in here. If you can just back up a little bit on the, the keyframes for me, please. Sure. So um, the way this works is we have to define what our own animation is. So we could actually fade from one color to another color, or we could um, make a little drift happen. So in order to do that, we start with a keyframe, right? A keyframe is basically saying, what do you want this animation to start at? And what do you want this animation to end at? So what we do is we say, when the animation starts, it's gonna start from an opacity of zero. And as that animation runs over the next second, we're going to work our way up to an opacity of one. Son of a. You figured it out? Would help if I spelled opacity right. Okay, sorry. I had opacity spelled wrong here. What I have no idea is why it worked on the H1 and not on the H3 the second time. But if you have opacity spelled right in both places, this animation will work on both of them. So what we can do is in these keyframes, we can do whatever we want. We can say it's going to start with a margin top of 100 px and it's going to work its way down to a margin top of 0px. And now we got a nice little drift going on there. OK, maybe not the, the quite the animation we want with the, the two things showing up. But in our keyframes, we basically get to control what's, what are we starting from and what are we working our way our animation to. So I'm going to take this out because we don't actually want that drift going on. But if you wanted to, you could put those in there. Does that answer your question? I believe it does. So the fade in that we're that we're using here and the fade in that we're using here 
are linking to this fade in that we defined here, then because we're starting from this point, the opacity zero is going to get applied to the H1 at the starting point. And then it's going to work its way up to an opacity of one over the duration of one second, which we defined here, or we defined in here. Hmm. Quick question. Yep. Can we have multiple keyframes? Yes. Um, you can actually define these as percentages if you wanted to. Um, so you can actually, instead of using from and to, you don't have to follow along with this. You could say 0%. We're going to get up um, to in 90%. We're going to do an opacity of uh, 0 0.9. Uh, that's not going to be visible, 0.5. And then at 100%, we're going to get to an opacity of one. So that's going to control. You see how it kind of slowly fades in and then pops at the end? That's because zero to 90 is taking 0.9 seconds to get up to a half percent. And then in the last 0.1 of a second, it's going up to the full opacity. So we could do that even as a slower really slow and then just have it pop all in at once, you can define multiple keyframes by using percentages in here. So the from and to would be the equivalent of writing it like this. At 0%, it should be zero. Um, at 100% done, it should be up to one. And that also achieves the same effect. But the from and the to are usually easier to understand. We're starting from an opacity of zero and working our way to an opacity of one over the duration of one second. We good to move on here? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna look at my final site and when I scroll down here, I've got this about section going on. So we're gonna get more practice with our flexing here. We're gonna get more practice with our styling and getting everything to show up right. So what I'm gonna do, I want this next section to be inside my container still, but I do not want it to be inside this section. I want it to be in its own section. So I'm gonna put my cursor at the end of the section line go down and create a new section. And while I'm creating that section, I know I'm going to want to style that. So I'm going to put an ID on it right off the bat. Then I'm going to get all of my content right. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to put an H1 in because I want that to be the biggest. And I'm going to put about in there. I'm then going to put in an H5. And I'm going to say Max has been a professional developer for a decade. He loves bragging about himself and is hard to get to shut up. You can put in whatever you would like in there. So I come back over. I scroll down and ew, it's in there but man, does it not look the way I want it to look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, in my about section, I want it to have a background color and I'm going to go back to my coolers, grab my color for the background and paste that sucker in. So I come back over here. Now, remember, I've got to scroll down because the top part of my website, I made to be 100% VH. I wanted that to take up the whole section of the screen. If I don't like that design, if I wanna change that, I can go up here and modify this 100 VH to be 75 VH, and then I'll be able to see that bottom section down there. So it's up to you how you wanna do that design. I'll leave it as this for now. Okay, 
Now this is down here, what's the most obvious thing? This text color, right? So I wanna style that next. I go to my about, I throw my color in here of white, I save, okay. That's all looking great now, but it's, it's up against the border there. Well, if I come in and look at this, I've got that nice breathing space going around the whole thing. Well, do I want to use margin or padding to achieve that? Padding. Padding, right? Because I want that background color to, to be included in the padding. Background is always, um, padding is always going to include the background in the border. The margin is outside the box for moving the box up or down. So in here, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to add some padding on this and let's guess 30 pixels. Not like I've ever made this before or anything. Okay, now I've got my padding in there and everything's looking good. Let me compare that to my other site. And I notice this text is a little bit smaller. Okay, so let's target that. Let's look for my um, I don't actually don't know where I do that. Um, I'm going to come in here and say, all right, in my about section, grab just the H5 and set the font size down to 32 pixels. Okay, that made it even bigger. Let's go down to 16 pixels. All right, that's looking good, but I still don't love the way that font is showing up. So maybe I come down in here and say, hey, the font size I'm going to use, I'm sorry, the font weight, that's bold, not bold, whatever. The font weight I'm going to use is normal. Ah, there we go. Now everything's looking the way I like. And if we compare that to this over here, that looks just about the same. You know what? There is a little gap between here and here that's smaller than the gap between here and here. But we didn't put that gap in. We don't know where that gap is coming from. So we're going to get more practice. We right-click, we inspect. And when we hover over that H1, we see that orange there. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom here, we can see that margin has an 8 put on it. And if we want to see what it looks like without that 8, we can double-click on the number 8 and actually type in the number 0 and the browser will live update and show us what it will look like with a margin of zero on that H5. The problem is we didn't apply that to our code. So when we refresh, that gap is gonna come back. So we look at this style.css, we say, hey, in this H5, there's a margin on the bottom that automatically gets added, set that to zero. Oh, sorry, not the H1, the H not the H5, the H1. And now when we look at that, our gap is gone and we've got our nice about section working for us. I'm gonna do one more section, but before we do, I'm gonna stop and pull here, give you guys a chance to either catch up on the code or again, go back through, even if class is whipping by, reading each line of code here, seeing how this all fits together. I, um, when you were in the inspect, mm -hmm. how did you select what you wanted to inspect? I tried to highlight it, but it didn't want me. So over here, if you go over the different sections of your code, you'll see it highlighting those sections in the in the browser above. Mm -hmm. And if you click on one of them, and that's that's what will change the column on the right side of the inspect to see all the details about it. And then you just flick all the way down to the bottom of that to get to the box model. So my box model, well, I don't have a border, padding 20. 
I guess I don't understand this part yet. Okay, so you've got padding. You've got the section selected right now. That's what's got the 20 pixels of padding on it or 30 pixels of padding. Mm, okay. Right, so if you click on the little arrow on the section right here, it's going to open the section and let you inspect the H1 and the H5 independently. So if you select the H1 and have not put your margin bottom zero on it yet, scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see the browser by default puts a margin on each uh, ones of eight pixels. I heard you, but I'm still trying to look at my code and the inspection. Okay, so in the inspect, yep. I'm going to take out my margin bottom right here in my CSS. Mm -hmm. So I'm just command uh, command slash is going to comment that out for me. Now over here, I've got a gap in my about and my H5. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that gap is. So if I hover over section here, I'm going to see that green show up. That green is padding. Green always is padding. So if I click on about and scroll all the way down to the bottom, I can see my 30 pixels of padding all around the box. Now I want to go see what's going on with the H1 inside that section. So I go over to the H1 and I click on about here. And now in my box model over here on the right, it's showing me I've got eight pixels right here on the bottom of the about. And you're clicking where to make that flash? The H1 about. Hmm. No, it doesn't like me. Okay, so I can see the brown underline under about. And that should match up with, oh, I don't have margin in there yet. Huh. So by default, the browser applies eight pixels of margin to the bottom okay. of the H1. Okay, so there's the eight. And so if we override that in our CSS and say, no, the margin should be bottom of zero, you'll see in the browser, we now don't have that eight down here in the box model. Margin. Maybe I don't have that tagged right. H1. All right, we got most of the votes in on the poll. Do you have any questions before we keep rolling forward? Anyone want to share their screen? I fixed that. Thanks, Max. Anyone need more time before we go forward? Feeling like we're understanding this? Not only do we see this stuff showing up, we're seeing how we can build something, right? So cool. All right. Now we're going to get into a fun section. We go back to what our final site looks like. And oh boy, got a contact form. And we come over here and we can click and we can actually enter things in here. But oh no, we've got things on the left. We got things on the right. We've got things on the left and the right all on the right. That to me says grid, right? So we could go through and we could draw our boxes here and say contact's going to be a row. 
Then we're going to have another row that contains all of this. And our column on the left, that's going to have the text. And the column on the right, that's going to have our form. So we're going to lay all of that out. We come over here. We add our new section. We're going to do an ID of contact. Now, in our section, we said we're already going to have a div class of a row. That row, this contact takes up the whole width of the of the um, of that row. So we say div class equals call twelve because we want it to take up the whole area, and then we say h one contact. Now we come down here and I go, now I, I want to see what that looks like. Oh boy, it's ugly. We got to fix that. So before we do anything else, let's look at our contact section looking right. Well, what I would like is for the color of the text, is it white? It is white. And I want there to be padding 30 pixels on it. So why don't I just reuse this section and say, I would like my contact section to look just like the about section. The only difference is the contact section is going to have a background of a particular color. I want my contact section to be this color blue. So I put my comma here because I want everything here to apply not only to the about section. I want the color white and the padding 30px to also apply to my contact section. So now I come back over, I see what it looks like. And now my contact section is looking just like my about section. OK, now I look at my design again. Oops, sorry. And I've got another row down here. And it looks like this is a column on the left, and this is a column on the right. So I need to say, where does this row start? This row starts at the end of the contact row. So I go into my code, and I say, this div lines up with this closing column. So I'm going to add a, a note in here that says end of call 12. Then I'm going to add a note in here, a comment that says end of first row in contact. Now that makes it much easier for me to say, well, if the row is the first row is done, I can put another div class in here of row and say div class call six and say text goes here. Then still inside my row, right? Maybe we add a comment in here that says end of first call in row number two. We can add another div class call six that says form goes here. Now let's clean up our comments and say end of uh, second call in row number two. And this is closing out the end of second row. Ma Max, in, in row 30 and row 37, does it make a difference whether you have a space after contact and a space after two? It does not. OK. Um, I'm sorry, ask that question again. Does it make a difference whether, like in row 30 and in row 37, uh, at the end of that row, does it make a difference if you have a, a space after contact and a space after two, just like how you did in row 34? Um, at, at the no. End the, okay. So anything in the comment is ignored, right? So the computer sees this uh, sequence of characters, the arrow, the exclamation point, and the dash dash and says, I am going to ignore whatever you put in here until I see a dash, dash, and an arrow. Okay. So I could put, um, surprise, and the computer wouldn't care because that is between 
the opening dashes and the closing dashes. So anything that we're putting in here, anything that goes in the comments is purely for our understanding. And that includes uh, spaces, doesn't matter how many spaces we put in there, because it's in a comment, it's gonna get ignored. Okay, okay, got it. So I come over here and I've got my contact, I've got text goes here and I've got form goes here. And this is where we're going to stop for the evening. So tomorrow, we're going to get our form working, and we're going to move into that portfolio section of building out our projects. And then we get to do all of the fun of setting up the project pages. So in the next four minutes, take that time to go back through, look through this code, and say, hmm, when I open this tomorrow, what am I going to say, man, I really wish I asked Max that last night. What are you going to do when you get out of class, you're reviewing this and you go, oh, darn, I do have a question. Spend the next four-ish minutes looking over the code, seeing if you guys have questions, and then we'll use the last 10 minutes of class to generate our terms or review any concepts. Just so I'm understanding this correctly, we should have three exact sections within yes. our code. Okay. And in each section, we've identified an ID or a style CSS. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Max, could you please show me where I'm not getting my pad? Oh, wait, hold on. Maybe I want pad in there. Okay. Okay, you got it or okay, you want to screen share? I got it. Okay. We like those more. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting to this point in class and you're like, I don't get this, right? That's when you reach out and you schedule one-on-ones with me because we either need to identify, hey, is this one little thing that you're hung up on? And if it's that one little thing, maybe it's just a one-on-one -on -one that's gonna get you over it. Or are you sitting here and going, wow, class just went by really quick, but I'm getting it. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on it. We're gonna keep on working on these projects and I'll get it, right? I will get to the point where I can write the code on my own. That's where we want you to be. If class is not feeling like it's flying by, we're doing something wrong in the boot camp. But when you are just sitting in class and you're like, I can't believe I just spent three hours and I'm drooling over here because I don't get this, right? If you're not having any light bulb moments or you didn't have any light bulb moments last week, reach out to us for a one-on-one. -on -one. We would much rather you come to us for help because you know when you need help quicker than we do. Right, we'll detect it in the homework assignments. We will reach out to you. We'll get academic warning. We'll do all of that stuff. We are proactive about that. But it's much better if you come to us first and say, hey, I need help. I'm not getting this. If you're feeling like you're like running to keep up, but you're running, you're feeling like you're, you know, you're making progress, that's great. If you feel like you are just getting dry, drug, dragged, dragged behind the bus, and it's going on and you're like, whoa, what did I sign up for? That's when you got to reach out to us. 
whether that's Ariel, whether that's me, whether that's a Slack message, whether that's a one-on-one, -on -one, hopefully it's a one-on-one -on -one because those one-on-ones are the time to go through the concepts and make sure, hey, maybe you just tripped at this one point and you just need a, a hand getting up. And once you get up, you might hit the ground running, right? This is not, we're only in week four here. This is the beginning of week four. This is the time to say, hey, does this make sense? And if it doesn't, reach out for that one-on-one. -on -one. And if one-on-one -on -one times don't work and you're like, I really need another time or the only time I can do a one-on-one -on -one is after class, shoot me a Slack message. We'll find a time that works for you. Christina, go ahead. So keep working on this, correct? No. Oh. Tomorrow we will pick up where we left off. Okay. Uh, where would you recommend we get um, extra homework, like to work on this stuff if we're, you know, got time to kill? Yeah. So Flexbox Froggy is going to be a good optional homework assignment to understand that a little bit more. Um, anything in Free Code Camp, even if I didn't assign it, is going to be really good practice as well. Um, because it's all project oriented, or if you do want to keep working in this file, but still have a version that is safe for class tomorrow, what I would recommend is going into Finder, going into your desktop and your My Code and your week four, and on this day one folder, right click on it and say duplicate. Then you can rename this as like my D1 version or whatever you want, right? Pop this open in VS Code with your file open folder. And now you're safe to play around and do whatever you want. Because when we start with class tomorrow, you can just duplicate your pristine day one folder, not worry about any of it breaking. Um, when we look in free code camp for the, um like assignments that relate to this, how do we know what they're called? Um, like, what, what would you recommend? Give me a second. Um, so if you scroll down, what we were working on was the, um, learn HTML forms by building a registration form, right? Mm -hmm. If you're like, I want more practice with forms, you can build this survey form. Oh, if you're okay. like, oh, I'm really struggling with the box model. I'm not really getting, you know, how margins and padding work, go down a little bit and here's the CSS box model. But if you're like, nah, I get it. Margins, paddings, I'm not having any problems there. Or where do I move on? Um, you can come down and say, this is a good project for kind of pulling it all together, right? Building some tribute page about like a memorial for someone. Or you can go down and this stuff, I don't think we've covered yet. Um, so uh, tribute page or anything above it, that's where you can practice in, in free code camp. That's not to say that we won't necessarily touch on all of these things in here, but even look, we've got learn CSS Flexbox by building a, yep. So you got Flex Flexbox right in here as well. That's what I want to catch up on. Okay. I mean, not catch up, but familiarize myself more. Yep. Cool. And if free code camp isn't your jam and you're like, damn it, Max, I hated free code camp over the homework over the weekend. I need something else, but I, I got extra things. Go on YouTube, right? Just do a search for learn CSS Flexbox and see what has a million views on it. And if it's got a million views, watch it. Um, there was a, a guy that um, Karen, who I know you've met in passing, she'll also come back and be TAing. Um, there's one guy on uh, YouTube, he's got a gazillion views cannot stand his accent. He says available instead of available. Mm -hmm. And Ariel was like, I cannot learn from this guy. I'm like, that's okay, right? Sometimes it, you'll find the perfect teaching style. You'll realize that videos are what you want and you won't connect with the person. 
Hopefully that's not happening with you and my instruction, but it does happen, right? Um, so research around. Some people would much rather read a blog post that mm. tells you all about using Flexbox instead of learning on a video or learning from Free Code Camp. All different learning styles, find the one that works for you. I'm not the only one who teaches how to code, right? Everyone, not everyone. There are a lot of different people who have tried to teach these concepts and that method may resonate with you more. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, or if you're like, I think this is what I want. I'm not quite sure. Um, shoot me the resource and I'll let you know. I'll, I'll review it for you and say, yeah, all of this looks good. Yeah. Or, hey, the first quarter of this looks all right, but it kind of goes off the rails here. This isn't the curriculum that we teach. If you've got a resource, I'm happy to review it. Um, obviously, if it's a three hour video, I, I won't be able to really get into it, but um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to review any resources that pop up. And if you find something like that cheat sheet that you want to share with your fellow students, uh, definitely, definitely do that. Thank you. Any final questions before we use the last four minutes for terms? Okay, let me switch back over to the outline if I can even find it. And if you notice, Ariel has been busy and has been filling out this outline for you to keep it up to date. She's very much appreciated. If you guys haven't noticed, we cover a lot of things in class that kind of pop up as we go. You got VH in there. That stands for viewport height. What else did we cover tonight that you would like to capture in your outline? Excuse me. And Zona, go ahead. The animation style. CSS animation a way to animate our uh, HTML via selectors using keyframes and duration properties. Opacity. Opacity. Uh, how transparent our selected element is. Flexbox. Flexbox. The devil. Oh, excuse me. The a um more powerful way of laying out our content. Um more powerful and complicated way of laying out our content to be flexible in the space it is defined. Before we keep going on this, Tina, I wanted to touch on something. If you are in Canvas, uh, let me leave student view. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, over here, uh, go to account and go down to settings. And then, oh, you pain in my butt. Once you enter your password, it will actually show you the time zone that you're set to. Um, if it is set to mountain time, you can click on edit settings over on the right and change it to Eastern time. With that said, all the, I'm in the wrong class. I wanna see, I think we got that fixed. Yes. All the assignments are now due at the proper time, which is Sunday at 11.59. Um, if your time is still not right, if it's saying it's due at like 10 p.m. or it's due at 2 a.m., go to account and go over to settings. And that's where in this screen you want to check and make sure it's on Eastern time and not mountain, mountain, mountain time. My God, I'm tired. Okay. Any <laughs> other terms that we want to capture? or phrases or concepts or anything for your notes. 
Did you say something about Frogger or Froggy or something? Yeah, that's this Flexbox Froggy up here. Oh, right. Gotcha. Okay. I can put it in here. Flexbox Froggy. Um, a free code camp style learning resource for mastering Flexbox. I and think they Frogger like Atari. Sorry. Anything else? Tag. One more time. The code tag. Like EM um, span, etc. Uh, applies mono space formatting to its contents keyframes one more time keyframes sorry keyframes 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 oh, key like a key keyframes key oh keyframe key thank you the zoom does um noise suppression and so when you're talking in a whole sentence it works fine but when there's only one word being said it cuts off the beginning of the word and it makes it really really hard to hear when one word is being said so i i apologize for that that is a shortcoming of zoom uh keyframe um i'm not going to do that definition justice uh let me see um I'm taking this right from Wikipedia. Um, in animation, a uh, drawing or shot that defines the starting and ending points of, whoa, starting and ending points of a smooth transition. And like the good academic that I am, I'm going to add in a source for that so people don't think I'm stealing right from Wikipedia. Anything else? All right, if you've got feedback to voice, uh fill out the 30 second feedback form that is in canvas otherwise you guys have an awesome night i will see you tomorrow we will get to work on the form section we're going to get another row and column inside of a existing row and column we're going to get our projects page built out which is also going to use columns and then we are going to use a tags for the first time in a project anchor tags to link everything together and after we do all of that, we're also going to use a pre-built bootstrap component and learn how we can use not just existing classes, but entire components that are pre-built so we don't need to build them from scratch. That's what's coming down the pipeline tomorrow. Any questions pop up, you know where I'm at in Slack. Otherwise, have an awesome evening, everyone, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Can you put the... Thing in the Slack, the whatever code yes. we did. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for those reminders because I clearly need them. <laughs> uh, live stream. And you are good to go. Exona, go ahead. Um, so I asked you a question earlier about the spacing and the bio, uh, provide a bio part of mm -hmm. last night's homework. I think you meant, I thought, I think what you thought I was saying was the text itself. No, I just wanted the spacing in be for the entire bar. So I don't really love the way they do that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm happy to go into it. Um, um, or I can just schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you for it, if that's better for you. If you don't mind, I just have to run out to grab something. Um, and I know they're waiting on me. 
So, um, totally fine. I'll schedule a one-on-one -on -one this week. Cool. Sounds good. The Thank short you. answer is, is that you modify it in the attributes in the text area for like how many rows you want it to be. Mm -hmm. I don't like that approach. I don't put rows on it. I go into my CSS and then set the height of the text area, which is what I prefer to do. Um, okay. But those are the two methods. If you want to play with them, if you can't figure it out, schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, we'll do. Thank you so much. Cool. Have a good night, guys. See you guys. Peace.